This is your World War III Day X update. A bit of an adjunct to last night's video that got cut short. I've been out here working all day on the farm, trying to get a homestead built for when Day X arrives. Now, I'm a little under the weather too, so I gotta make this quick, but just a few points. What you're hearing right now about ceasefire negotiations are a total sham. When Biden says that we're close to getting a deal and, uh, you know, we're really close and, and, and please don't attack until, you know, we're done negotiating because we're really close to a deal. Number one, the Iranians have already stated unequivocally that Gaza's business is Gaza's business. The issue that Iran has with Israel is external to that. It's a do with Israel's violation of their sovereign territory in the terrorist attack they just committed by assassinating a high-ranking official on Iranian soil. In addition to that, Hamas is not invited to these no negotiations. Iran is not invited to these negotiations. Hezbollah is not invited to these negotiations. Nobody within the axis of resistance, aside some pseudo-intermediary in Qatar, is invited to the table. This is one big sanctimonious circle jerk between the United States, Israel, Egypt, and somebody from Qatar who is allegedly speaking on Hamas's behalf, but isn't, of course, because Sinwar is in the tunnels of uh, the Gaza Strip right now. Hamas has already rejected this deal that's being proposed. So this is all a sham just to buy time to continue to move more weapons into the Middle East. As we speak, one third of the U.S. Navy is positioning itself within the Middle East for a massive war that's about to erupt. They're saying, of course, it's to prevent a war. I go back to Day X Thucydides trap hypothesis. Right now, the United States is seeing that they are declining superpower. And the only way that they can, the only chance they have left of stopping the progress of these emerging powers is to declare war on them and go for broke and hopefully try to defeat them. The problem is Iran appears to be ready. Now I'm going to talk about the Iranian capabilities in just a moment. I got cut off in my video yesterday where I was talking about that, but we should probably talk a little bit about the power outage that was sustained in Lebanon today. And I believe that it's may still be ongoing. This was a nationwide power outage that was in Lebanon, uh, with the exception of Hezbollah, who has their own independent power systems, because they're preparing for war with Israel. Could this be uh, that they are preparing to ration supplies? Because I believe their power plants run on the petrol-based uh, power plants, so they burn combustible fuel, diesel, <coughs> excuse me, and there are shortages of uh, that around the world right now due to wars that are, are waging everywhere. And it could be that they're getting ready to ration supplies in anticipation of major shortages on the horizon as they go into war with Israel. Now, it could also be that Hezbollah is attempting to operate under the cover of darkness because there is a divide between the Lebanese government and Hezbollah. These are not the same entities. In fact, I think there's been numerous attempts to try to incite civil war between these groups because that, of course, would do the work uh, of the IDF for them. But right now, you have the Lebanese government, who is largely in control in delivering power to these regions, ceasing to provide electricity to hospitals, airports, and other critical infrastructure required for that society to function. Now, the question is, why have they done it? Or is it that they have done it? Or is it that Hezbollah has done it? Have they done it in an attempt to preserve supplies for the upcoming war? Or did they have their arm twisted by Hezbollah into doing it? Or did Hezbollah hack these systems or sabotage these systems? Why would Hezbollah do that, you say? Well, 
there's clearly a lot of espionage right now. There are a lot of moles inside Lebanon that are helping the Israelis target these high-ranking Hezbollah officials. Uh, we're seeing this time and time again. There was a couple more that got assassinated today. So that means that they're leveraging whatever sort of technology that's in the region, be it surveillance cameras, telecommunications, you know, Wi-Fi, uh, whatever the Internet of Things has to offer, what anything that's hackable, they're probably using it against uh, these groups who are trying to operate in under the cover of darkness. The Israelis are largely dependent on technology to wage their wars. And if you can deprive them of that, and if you can fight in the dark, that's what they like to do. Okay, so it could very well be that this was some 4D move by Hezbollah to take down the power grid so that they can get their stuff into position knowing full well what's about to go down. Now, the window of opportunity I would say that it's nearly closed in terms of this axis of resistance, as they call themselves, to preemptively strike Israel um, while the United States military was not strong within the region. Now, the numbers that we're seeing with the U.S. Navy is going to be around 40,000 troops. So it's not a sizable amount of troops, but they are packing a lot of firepower. But as that old saying goes, a ship is a fool. To fight a fort and if that fort is iran where they have i can't remember what the actual number is it's something like 60 to 70 large underground deep underground military missile city complexes that are up to 700 meters below solid granite well the only thing that's going to uh, shake the foundations of those bunkers and maybe just put a little bit of dust on the commander's desk is going to be a nuclear weapon. But what that might lead to is a radiological incident, which could prevent access to some of these facilities. Now, I got cut off in my video yesterday where I was telling you about a diplomat by the name of Amir al Musawi. In an interview with al Mayadeen, which is one of Lebanon's primary news agencies. This is a former Iranian diplomat, very well respected. He had revealed that Iran has been threatened with a nuclear strike in back channel communications. Now think about what that means. That means that Israel or somebody within the Israeli government, we can presume, who is probably speaking on behalf of the United States, is saying that if you strike Israel in a capacity that they deem inappropriate, which as they've already claimed is the loss of any civilian life, we are going to do a nuclear strike on your nuclear facilities. Now the tune has somewhat changed today, I should say, and things are, you, you can never really believe, you know, half of what you hear and like, what or what do they say? Believe none of what you hear and half of what you see nowadays. And you know, that really bears out on the internet. But today the Israelis are saying that they're going to target Iran's energy infrastructure. So Iran, of course, is largely dependent on its oil exports, specifically to China. If you were to do that, that puts China in a bad way. China has a vested interest in seeing that that doesn't happen. How do you see that that doesn't happen? Well, you give Iran nuclear weapons. There's a very high likelihood at this point in time that Iran does, in fact, have nuclear weapons. They're in bed with the North Koreans. They're in bed with the Russians who have been sending cargo planes there on a daily basis for the last couple of weeks. They're in bed with the Chinese. The Chinese are dependent on Iranian oil. The Chinese don't want Iran to go to war. They don't want that energy infrastructure to be destroyed because it's going to take a long time to rebuild. And they know that Thucydides' trap dictates that the United States is trying to undermine their energy supply by going to the source. If you can take out Iran, you can set China back a little bit. Maybe this is why there's reports, and I should say they're very sketchy, like it's one or two videos coming out of China moving tanks towards the direction of Taiwan. They're not on trains. They're going through the streets, which is kind of weird. Is it just an exercise? Who knows? And how many tanks are there? Was it 10? People are exaggerating, saying it was 1,000. Who really knows? 
Uh, but China has every incentive that when this starts, that's when they're going to go make a move on Taiwan, considering uh, and that's all going to be dependent on how good the weather is in the Taiwan Strait, because there's only s two short windows with throughout any given year that you can actually do a landed invasion of Taiwan when it's feasible, when the weather would even permit such a thing in the first place, because the strait is too rough. But uh, so Iran, according to this Amir al-Musawi, has emphasized that the country has affirmed that any nuclear attack would be met with a proportional response. So let me just, uh, maybe he's playing a semantic word game there. But if you ask me, a proportional response to a nuclear attack would necessitate the use of nuclear weapons. Understand, Iran has nuclear centrifuges in deep underground military bunkers that the IAEA likely doesn't have any access to since the breakdown of the JCPOA. Now, they claim to still be, even though the JC, the, the IAEA, is claiming that the Iranians are not cooperating. The Iranians are saying they are, but I mean, who are you going to believe? So uh, they have cameras in these places allegedly to prove, you know, what they're doing with the, the nuclear fuel. And uh, I don't know all the technicals of how it works exactly, but there's a very high likelihood that the, the Iranians at this point in time, why wouldn't you be building nukes? You'd be stupid to. When you see these sham negotiations, uh, ongoing as an attempt to move more weapons into position. It, clearly, they realize that they can't trust anybody at this point, and that even if they were to broker a deal with the United States, uh, you got Trump coming in there, possibly, I think it's looking a little unlikely at this point. Unfortunately, uh, the way things are going in that election, just, you know, the nature of politics in the United States, I could see Kamala coming out on top. And then you got a civil war in the United States to contend with, or civil unrest, we should say. Either, either way, you're going to have civil unrest. Uh, there's no doubt about that. But I'm not going to make any uh, prescriptions with respect to that. But I will say that, and I've long since stated that there were people at the beginning of this, after the assassination attempt, ruling Kamala out. And I was like, nope. We know how American politics goes. They want it as a dead heat right to the finish. But Iran knows that if they don't make a move soon, that Trump is going to come back to office and Trump will allow them to go full bore. Now, what is that really going to mean? Because I've stated recently that Trump is living in the past in terms of American military capability. Iran is no longer a... They're not in Iraq, okay? This is an advanced military they have advanced equipment now they have more equipment from russia they have more missiles than they have bases to store them in and they're all deeply embedded in underground bunkers this is a massive landmass uh far bigger than than texas okay and mountainous i mean forget about it they can't did you know that iran is four thousand times bigger than the gaza strip and they still can't find a leader which is buried in the tunnels of the Gaza Strip. The only solution they're going to have, and it's not going to be a solution because it's just going to create global chaos, is to throw a few nukes at some Iranian nuclear bunkers or alleged underground nuclear facilities and just hold on for dear life. That's all they have. That's all they can do. And Iran and the axis of resistance knows it. Because what the axis of resistance can do is they can turn up the heat. They can start asymmetrically targeting critical infrastructure all throughout the region. That's why Biden gave the green light to start sending the Saudi Arabians weapons again in order to get them on their good side to try to uh, revive the Abraham Accords and, and try to pit Iran against Saudi Arabia once again because they know that the Houthis, who have been incredibly quiet lately, if you've noticed, they're, they're stockpiling. They're getting ready for day X. All of these, the, the blackout today, I'm certain that this was preparation for day X. Day X is going to be when the whole shit starts. I mean, is it any coincidence, guys, that a nationwide blackout happens in Lebanon after they've evacuated all the foreign nationals? Come on, think about it. So the other wild card here is Putin who is allegedly flying to Azerbaijan, which is in the southern part 
of uh, Russia. That's the southern flank. Okay, he's flying there for two days, which is a very risky move, to say the least. Uh, to go, you know, anywhere, I would I'd probably advise him not to go there. I'm sure he's going to be escorted by countless amounts of uh, military fighter jets and all kinds of security was probably prerequisite to this meeting. Uh, rumors are that he is going there to try to get Azerbaijan to stay out of whatever is about to happen uh, because he knows that if Iran starts lighting up Azerbaijan and Turkey starts going at it with Azerbaijan, then there's a potential for their southern flank to be compromised. And Putin wants Iran to go to war, it would appear, because they have some Machiavellian interests, we'll say, in Iran taking a little bit of the heat off of them in what's happening in Kursk. And good luck finding any accurate information about what is going on in Kursk. You would think that the, the Ukrainians have kind of started spinning their wheels a little bit and they're not making a lot of progress. If you're listening to any of the, the Russia bros, you know, and, and the, the Russo bros talk about how they're starting to take prisoners now. And, you know, there's a lot of videos that they're celebrating catching these uh, these guys who were uh, at once looting stores within Kursk, not in Kursk, but in uh, Sudzwa, I believe the, the Sudza is the town that Ukraine currently has uh, control over and numerous other villages throughout there finally being caught and, you know, having a camera stuck in their face, which is, of course, a violation of the Geneva Convention. If you haven't noticed, the Geneva Convention is just a bunch of bullshit at this point. And we're still supposedly in the civilized phase of SHTF. I mean, could you imagine the horrendous atrocities that are going to be committed when the lights go out and when there's no cameras on? I mean, we see what's going on when the cameras are on and when we still have a kangaroo ICC, International Criminal Court. Imagine what happens when Day X arrives and the lights go out, okay? So uh, I, I keep deviating away from Al Musawi's comments, but uh, according to Al Musawi, those conveying the threats were met with far stronger responses. Moreover, he urged the people to disregard unfounded claims of alleged Iranian cowardice circulating on social media. Al Musawi concluded, affirming that Iran is fully prepared to counter the Zionist, Zionist entity alongside its allies in full force. So this uh, notion that the Iranians are, are backing out and they're cowards. Number one, this is just a very irrational way of thinking when it comes to war. Um, you never want to be in, in a position where you are provoked into reacting. That's never uh, a position of strength. That's not being on the initiative. You want to be on the initiative. And right now, Iran is actually in an advantageous position because the ball is in their court. Uh, how they deal with that situation is going to dictate the outcome of this event. And Iran is probably thinking to themselves, like, we're as, we're as good as we're ever going to be in terms of military parity between the West and ourselves. And Russia is hoping that Iran takes a little bit of that edge off. So they're trying to embolden the Iranians by sending them advanced weapon systems, which is not to say that the Iranians don't have advanced weapon systems. After all, they're the ones who are currently sending weapons to Russia. So the weapon systems that the Russians are sending are, are more advanced missile defense systems, probably some electronic uh, warfare as well which could potentially throw off uh, any sort of Israeli, you know, style attack. I almost think that the electronic warfare is probably going to be more useful than the S-400s, but I don't know enough about that kind of stuff to really have an, an, an informed uh, commentary on it. <sighs> but it looks as though the Iranians are as prepared as they are going to be since Trump left office, their industrial industry has grown by 400%. And a lot of people think that that's because Joe Biden gave him $6 billion. 
Uh, this is a nation, and it bears repeating that you need to go and look up the purchasing power parity of uh, the the GDP and the PPP of Iran. It's massive. It's north of tr one trillion dollars. So the the notion that you know these guys have and and think about it. This is post Suleimani, and it's incredible how we've come full circle. Because since Soleimani's assassination, which was in late 2019, and then you had the Australian wildfires, and then we all know what happened between 2020 and 2023. It's been like a, a blur, a, just this flurry of unprecedented crisis after crisis after crisis. And now here we are, smack dab in the Middle East once again. The Iranians have been preparing since Soleimani's death. They still have yet to truly avenge Suleimani's death, who was one of their top commanders, their top commander. And that's what they're going to do. And they're as prepared as they're going to be. And now the West knows it and there is no more nuclear deal. So it's, it's basically, you know, it's game on at this point. And all of the allies of Israel have now doubled down and said, not only are we going to defend Israel, but we're also going to partake in the offensive campaign that ensues thereafter. We're talking about France, the UK, and of course, uh, the United States, who will pretend like they're strategically ambig ambiguous, but uh, at the end of the day, we all know exactly uh, you know, that they're the ones who are keeping uh, the Israelis alive. Without the United States, uh, Israel would get steamrolled in the Middle East, probably just by Hezbollah and Hamas and maybe some of the Iranian-backed militias. You wouldn't even need the IRGC uh, because they just don't have the numbers, okay? So you have right now a situation where they're attempting to stall the axis of resistance response by saying that peace negotiations are going to be finalized by next Friday. Well, what else is going to happen by next Friday, you say? Well, the USS Abraham Lincoln and the Carrier Strike Group are headed towards the Middle East, and they're about five to six days out. So that those timelines seem to line up, don't they? <sighs> That's what's going down. You got... Uh, Ramzan Kadyrov driving around in a cyber truck like an idiot. I mean, I went on a bit of a rant on a social media platform yesterday because the utter complacency, you know, a lot of these Russia bros, these Russia, Russia bros who celebrate so early, they count their chickens before they hatch. You know, this is the reason why the Russians are taking so many L's in this conflict because they do stupid shit like this. They they celebrate prematurely and they always maximize their gains and they minimize their losses. And they always throughout this entire conflict have been underestimating the Ukrainians. Never count your chickens before they hatch. If I was in some way involved in that conflict, I would never celebrate any victory until you had total victory. I think that's the only way to truly win a conflict is to never celebrate until total victory has been achieved. Screw boosting morale. Just get the job done. And so the, the, the lackadaisical nature with which a lot of these guys are operating, driving around a cyber truck because Elon Musk sent it to you. And <clears throat> I mean, that's a Trojan horse, man. I mean, everything that goes on in that cyber truck could be recorded and sent back to the CIA. It is the biggest trojan horse in the world in fact x spacex i've talked about this before tesla itself it's all a trojan horse to bring in the next phase of things but we'll save that for another video according to iran's interim foreign minister ali bagari khani Referring to the aggression and criminal nature of the Zionists in Gaza, I warned about the deceit and dishonesty of the criminal gang ruling Tel Aviv and their most important supporter, the United States, at the negotiating table. So he's essentially saying that we don't buy whatever it is you're trying to put in front of us. 
Why would they? Why would they buy that when they see all of this military equipment moving in? And now they're doubling down on the acceleration of weapon shipments to Israel. We're talking about shiploads after shipload every single day. And they're accelerating the uh, deployments of these weapon systems to the region. We haven't really heard much about troop deployments, but I can tell you this. When my buddy over at uh, the freeze-dry wholesale company told me, he said, Nate... I'm getting orders like you would not believe from the U.S. military with accelerated timelines that I've never seen in my career. I'm not going to give specific dates and, and details beyond that. Uh, I knew that this was the big one that they're preparing for because they need the rations, they need the supplies in order to fuel uh, the militaries. I'm not sure if anybody in the military out there wants to comment on whether or not people are being uh, called up or you're seeing more people being called up from reserves or uh, any abnormal amounts of military activity. It could just be that they're going to be partaking in an Air Force, uh, air and naval capacity, and it's not going to involve a, a ground-based campaign. But that inevitably will be something that has to come because the IDF is just simply ill-equipped at in terms of manpower especially when shit heart starts to hit the fan there especially when people start to flee okay when you start running out of conscripts it's not a country of 40 million like ukraine it's a country of what was it like maybe 10 million on a good day and half of those people are uh, adversarial towards the regime. So, and yes, I, I do call it a regime. Everything in, in the Middle East is a regime. We're a regime. Everything nowadays is a regime. So we're just going to refer to every government as a regime from this point forward. Now, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, is saying that uh, they're noticing some abnormal activity at the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant uh, after a, a drone incident and that the situation is deteriorating rapidly, they claim. The Russians are claiming, remember that big hoopla about a nuclear dirty bomb attack? Well, they're claiming that any attempt by Kiev to trigger a global disaster will be met with immediate retaliation. Here's how you know who's telling the truth on that issue. If something happens after all of the the uh the hype that that russia has created around iran's alleged dirty bomb uh, attack that they're planning if if something still happens then you probably know it was the russians if nothing happens then you know the ukrainians were in fact preparing for that but the russians through back channel communications to likely the united states called them and said hey it's time to uh, put a kibosh on this plan because, you know, we're going to retaliate with either nuclear weapons or who knows what. The Russians are incredibly reserved, it does appear. Speaking of the Russians, there was a story and a video that got leaked today of the Moscow subway doors, the, the hermetically sealed uh, blast doors in the subway because the Moscow subway is set up for nuclear war. And I don't know if they did this as a signal to the United States or whoever, but it's, it's a very interesting video and I would encourage you to go and watch it. If you didn't know, these subways are built for nuclear war. They're not like the ones in New York. They have doors that seal. They are down very, very deep. And when I think it was Stalin who built them, um, he built them for that specific purpose, okay, to ensure that the majority of people would survive a nuclear blast. The Russians think nuclear war is survivable. Go watch our video that we just released about surviving nuclear war, okay? Now, I should probably talk a little bit about Ukraine ruining secret peace talks. According to the Washington Post, there were secret peace talks underway Moscow and Kiev were negotiating a moratorium on striking energy infrastructure before the Kursk incursion. So basically Ukraine just threw a wrench into that whole plan. And uh, so that's it now. But you know, the Russians, they're so incredibly tolerant. I would not be surprised that despite an invasion into their territory, based on what we've seen 
thus far that they would still be willing to go and negotiate, which is crazy when you think about it. We're going to have to see how this Kirk th Kursk thing finally plays out. And lastly, uh, Russian nuclear weapons development company cyber attack by defense intelligence of Ukraine. Hackers have successfully attacked Vega, the only supplier in the city of Snezinsk. As a result, the work of all Russian Research Institute of Technical Physics was paralyzed, probably only temporarily, I'm presuming. So not a huge L taken by the Russians, but uh, still not good if you're a Russia bro. Let me know what you guys are seeing in the comments section below, specifically with respect to military deployments throughout the United States. Is it busy or is it just business as usual? Thanks for watching, my friends. Take care. Canadian Prepper out.